um, I'm pleased and honored um, to start the, our next session entitled Mystics, uh, judging by the topics and the speakers we are uh, facing a most interesting and intriguing session. Our first speaker uh, will be Judith Weiss. Uh, uh, she is a Mandel uh, Scholion research in the uh, research, she is a member in the Mandel Scholion uh, Research Center in the Humanities and Hebrew University in Jerusalem. She studies medieval Kabbalah and Renaissance, Christian Kabbalah. She is the author of the Christian Kabbalistic Messiah in the Renaissance, and, uh, Guillaume Postel and the Book of Zohar. A second book which includes an annotated Hebrew translation of Postel's Latin Zohar commentary, as well as a third book on Postel's Hebrew treatise, Tam Hatamim, are to appear later this year. Her main current project deals the medieval Christian context of early Jewish Kabbalah. And with, uh, uh, and with the Cardinal Egidio Tabitebos, Kabbalistic thought. She is a member, as I said, she is a Mandel Scholio postdoctoral fellow. Thank you, please. So, uh, thank you. In my lecture today, I will focus on a Hebrew treatise composed in 1552 by the French scholar Guillaume Postel, a renowned Orientalist, yet often repudiated mystic. The treatise, entitled Tamate Amim, addresses... No? That's not well. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Tamat Amim addresses Jews in the Hebrew language in an attempt to pursue them of the veracity of Fustel's unique messianic ideas, which could be described very generally as a sort of Kabbalistic millenarian Catholicism. To the best of my knowledge, the Hebrew version of Tamat Amim was never copied, and it is safe to say that its circulation at best was very limited. Nevertheless, our subject being the converters uh, themselves, their motivations and strategies, and analysis of Tama Tamim uh, will serve as well as a platform for understanding Postel's unique identity as a converter. And what follows, I'll discuss some of the strategies Postel used in Tama Tamim, and show that while many explicit and implicit, me implicit means have been employed in this treatise in terms of language, form, rhetoric, and contents in order to attract Jews and convince them to convert, other strategies seem to aim at achieving quite the opposite. My claim will be that considering the entire gamut of the heterogeneous features of Tamatamim can shed light on Postel's objective, which did not in fact aim to convert Jews from one religious state to another, but to convert them to a third religious state, which in a way was a sort of constant conversion in itself. But before investigating uh, Tamat Amim as a missionary treatise, let's start with a short introduction to Postel's background and his original uh, religious thought. So, who was Guillaume Postel, our converter? Uh, a real genius in many humanistic disciplines and most prominently in languages, his simple and poor origin did not deter him from attaining an esteemed academic uh, reputation already in his early 20s. But his heart drew him in other directions. He began experiencing mystical visions, calling him to herald the messianic age of world union under French rule. Soon he found himself deserted and thrown out of the comfortable courtly life of Francis I. And later on, he was also dismissed by the new Jesuits in Rome, whose company he sought. At this unstable stage of his life, he came across Kabbalah through Hebrewists and Jewish teachers, but most prominently through Hebrew and Aramaic texts, the Zohar, the Bahir, and Merkanati's commentary on the Torah. At first, he says, these seemed vague, their symbolic language totally unclear. Then a miracle happened. He incidentally met a middle-aged Venetian mystic, yes. uh, Johanna, an illiterate nun named Johanna, who believed that she was the designated Papa Angelicus, or should we say Angelica, who was to endorse a feminine messianic age. The two became fully engaged with Kabbalah, and mainly the Zohar, meeting daily and having Zohar Chavrutas. And it was in this period in his life that Postel's theological thought reached its full stature. Based on the dozens of treatises he composed in these years, as well as later on, which seemed to be based on an amalgamation of uh, Aristotelian, millenarian, 
psychological, biblical, typological, trinitarian, hermeneutic, Kabbalistic, Sephirotic, and other types of notions, I uncovered that one common theological structure or infrastructure, which I use as a tool for understanding his writings. In a nutshell, it is a quadruple structure, uh, which is based on the epitome of the Sephirotic structure of, of Castilian Kabbalah, namely uh, two upper elements, a male and a female, and two lower elements, male and female uh, alike. I will not expand on this structure, which is not our subject today, but two points are of significance for our purpose. First, the centrality of the feminine element, and second, the double or parallel structure from which it follows that also history, together with any other dimension of the existence, acts in double forms. In addition to his interest in Kabbalah, already as a young man, Postel dreamt of universal co uh, conversion to Catholicism composing comprehensive treatises dedicated to this cause. Uh, in addition to the, the ones he wrote in Latin, we have two missionary treatises in the Hebrew language, aimed at convincing Jews of his unique version of millenarian Kabbalistic Catholicism. This is the first, oh sorry, this is the one we just discussed, the one with the, the Oh, no, and the second of these uh, two treatises is the Tam of 1552, uh, which I will discuss today. Postel composed Tam Atamim in Hebrew, and later on he produced a somewhat abridged Latin translation of the work, which he entitled uh, Ratiotion. Unlike the Latin version, which was eventually printed, the Hebrew version remain, remained in one manuscript only, uh, Postel's autograph, extant today at the BNF. And I prepared an annotated edition of Tama Tamim, which is hopefully to appear by the end of this year. Uh, Tama Tamim is written as one single consequential unit, with no divisions into chapters or paragraphs, and in a rather a cumbersome and tangled Hebrew style, uh, which confronts the reader with many linguistic challenges, both syntactical and morphological. And we will touch upon some of these and what follows. With regard to its contents and structure, Tam and Tamim's uh, pivotal points are the original sin and the eschatological struggle between Satan and the Messiah. In Tam and Tamim, Postel develops his views on these issues, beginning with the assertion that sin was introduced into the world due to Satan's intervention and was not part of God's original plan. Subsequently, he says that only the Messiah, being himself of feminine nature and therefore fit to undo Eve's uh, mystery, can overcome Satan. However, it should be stressed that in Pastel's view, sin is not only primordial or biblical, but also actual and present in his own time. After Christ's first advent, which is described as a male advent, the Christian world underwent horrible religious deterioration, expressed first and foremost in the papacy and in the Pope's general conduct, as well as in his claim to overpower church councils. According to Postel, as a result of this shameful situation, the nun Johanna revealed herself in what is described as the second and female advent, uh, yes, uh, heralding the need, the need to kill the Pope and endorse the messianic age led by universal political structure of uh, king and priest, male and female. Another main issue in Tamatamim, closely related to the first, this is the millenarian division of history into ages, which is designated in Hebrew as avotot, Latin uh, equivalent of vinculi. There are three such ages, but th the third is again double. And so uh, the quadruple structure is again apparent. This duplicity of the last feminine age refers to a double feminine advent of Christ. The first, Johanna, was Joan of Arc. And the second, Johanna, is the Venetian nun Joanna, Postel's spiritual mother. Finally, resuming an exceptionally fierce tone against the Pope, Postel asserts that Joanna's, uh, uh, Joanna's advent as a feminine Christ in 1548 was a divine reaction to the anti conciliaristic decrees issued in Bologna in 1547. He then concludes with a series of quotes from the Targums, all supporting his messianic claims. So in what way can Tamatami be seen as a treatise written to, in order to convert Jews? I think it is safe to say that insofar as Postel, Postel's own subjective purpose is concerned, 
Talmud Amin does seem to have been composed out of genuine hope that it would uh, be read by Jews who would become persuaded of Kostel's theological message. Uh, the following features of Talmud Amin can support this hypothesis. First, uh, Kostel's evident efforts to write in the Hebrew style, which would sound as natural as possible for Jewish ears. Although this was the second attempt, well, at least the one that we know of, uh, in writing Hebrew, it is very clear that he was not nearly as proficient in the Hebrew as he was in the Latin or Italian. Reading Tama Te'amim, Postel's remarkable efforts to write in the Hebrew stand out, not only in what regards uh, considerations of grammar and style, but also in his use of his own original and quite ingenious Hebrew neologisms when he was lacking vocabulary. As a matter of fact, I was unable to find even one single non-Hebrew word in Tama Te'amim. One common example of, of his ingenuity in what regards the use of neologisms, um, just one example that I picked for you, is the word amimut he uses for maternity, perhaps derived from uh, the Arabic umuma, and its counterpart avivut for paternity. Second, and again related to the issue of Hebrew, in Tamat Amin, Postel Hebraized non Hebrew names again in quite a remarkable manner. One favorite example is that of Paul the Apostle. Postel names him. Paul, with an I, instead of the more common and natural Aleph. For example, And this is why the Messiah King is a double-faced androgen, two kings wearing one crown, and this is the secret of Paul the Apostle. Literally, this form, Paul, means passive or acted upon, opposite of agent or active. It seems that Postel expressed through this form Paul's nature as someone acted upon by God, or sent by God. Uh, third, most of the allusions or citation he uses are to rabbinic literature, to the Old Testament, and to the Targums. In what regards references, in Tama Tamim, Postel completely refrained from citing the Gospel. However, he did make use of a few Christian sources. First, he briefly describes the acts of Paul and Peter, under Hebraized names, of course. Second, I've noticed that he covertly integrates short phrases of the Catholic Creed into different parts of Tama Tamim, such as the Homo Factus Est, Posifixus Tampasus, Lumen de Lumine, and others. I'm sorry, I'm not bringing examples of everything because of the time limitations, but I have others. Uh, the, other, uh, the only other extra-biblical Christian sources I could locate were two overt references to Bernard of Clairvaux. Remarkably, not only does Postel explicit, explicitly mentions uh, Bernard's name, he also eulogizes him as an outstanding rabbi, Rav, and adds an interesting uh, phonetical interpretation on his name. אם נוצרים ואם יהודים או בני ברית, ששמו בר נרד, שצי, שהוא באמת נרד, אשר נתן לכל העולם כולו. והוא הרב הגדול, כתב באמת, כי למלך המשיח יש לו שלושה דעות אלינו, וכולי, and as has been written by the greatest rabbi of all rabbis, whether Christians or Jews or sons of the covenant, whose name is בר נרד, who is indeed a spite nard, who sent for its order to the whole world, and he, the great rabbi, indeed wrote uh, that the Messiah King has three advents into us, etc. To conclude, from what we've seen so far, it seems that Postel took substantial measures in order to style Tama Tamim in a manner that will, re that will reduce antagonism on the part of the potential Jewish readers and facilitate the way uh, for their persuasion. In what regards uh, contents, I'd like to discuss just one major issue of Tama Tehavim, which is Postel's attitude toward the Pope and the papacy, in other words, his conciliar conciliaristic views. Indeed, in Tama Tehavim, Postel fiercely expresses his revulsion from the actual Pope and from the papacy in general, and he repeatedly determines that they are to perish in the coming messianic age, in which they will be substituted by a priest, Kohen, who will serve as the universal pope, cooperating with the universal king, Melech. It should be noted that two prominent trends of thought are incorporated in this point. First, uh, the Jochite notion of a pope and of double reign of king and priest. 
and second, what is generally referred to as conciliarism, uh, namely the religious political movement that became prominent in the 15th century, which advanced the, the demand that the authority of decisions made by the church councils would overpower that of the pope. Postel identified with these ideas with great order, even when the price was dear. If you recall, in Tama Te Amin, he indeed explicitly claims that the anti-conciliaristic decrees issued in Bologna in 1547 were the immediate reason for Johanna's revelation to him that year. That's how I read it, but there are other options. Al kol etza hakodesh shel knisato. Ha'apifio haromi ba'ir Bologna im ezer shel melech fransois melech tzarfat sh'ratza ken l'ra lo v'la'olam kulo. Ki az kol sidro shel olam mevulbal u'mechorav kol davar. V'ze shana atakmaz l'ishuotenu. When the Roman Pope elevated himself over his multitude, over the entire Holy Council of his church in the city of Bologna with the assistance of Francis, King of France, who wanted this, though it would harm him and the whole world, and it happened in the year 1547 to our salvation. Nevertheless, all this conciliarism does not seem to sufficiently explain the extraordinarily harsh pejoratives Postel uses in Tamat Tamim in references to the Pope himself, as in the following. צריך על כל פנים שמלך המסתתר שוב עד בתוכנו ויהרוג לדעתי, עוד לא קוצה ויהרג, המשומד הזה בין העמלק האמורי האפיפיור של רומא עד תכלית מיטתו, ואיתם הוא חטאים מן הארץ ורשעים עוד אינם. And therefore it is necessary that the concealed king will return into us forever, or perhaps the king who was concealed within us since eternity, I'm not sure, and will kill this apostate, or that the apostate be killed, son of Amalek, Amorite, Pope of Rome, up to his absolute death, and let sinners be consumed out of the earth and the unjust, so that they be no more. No doubt, these harsh, harsh expressions, along with the straightforward hope that the Pope be killed, would have had to be somewhat pleasant for Jewish ears. I feel that Postel let his innermost opposition to the Pope run freely here. Perhaps he felt safer writing in Hebrew. Perhaps he understood that Talmud Yamim was not to achieve substantial circulation anyhow. But in addition to these, it seems that he felt, in this case, the relief of finally conversing with people who were on the same page in what regards the Pope. Indeed, the Latin, a later Latin version he produced is significantly softer. In the Latin, the Pope is only a blasphemer, and he is to be killed by the Messiah in somewhat a uh, spiritual way. Uh, it is necessary that he kills the blasphemer with his spirit. That's a bit better, I think. Mm -hmm. However, I do not know of examples similar to, similar to this uh, in those texts which, address, which he addressed to Protestants. And therefore, it seems that the issue of language and circulation should be uh, first and foremost underlined. Notwithstanding all that has been said, it does also seem appropriate to take into consideration the character of the specific pope uh, in office at the time, which was a Julius III. Uh, he was pope until 1555. Putting it mildly, uh, Julius was not a very impressive or successful pope, and he was regarded as a weak leader, uh, who, was also, who also had the bad judgment of putting himself at the heart of a public homosexual scandal. Uh, and if this wasn't enough for Postel, Julius was also quite negative with regard to Jewish texts, as can be seen from the, from, for example, from the pamphlet he composed, or at least he published, I'm not sure he composed, against, uh, entitled Against Jews Who Hold Books in Which Anything Against the Catholic Faith is Mentioned or Written. Should then Tamatamin be regarded as a missionary treatise? A few prominent difficulties are still troubling. Why aren't any Jews mentioned in Tamatami? Why does Postel not articulate his ideas as preferable to Jewish tenets, and instead presents them as criticism of Catholic tenets, and first and foremost on uh, the principle of papacy? If he indeed tr uh, did try to convince Jews to convert, why did he present the church in such a negative manner? Another puzzling point has to do with Kabbalah. If indeed he is addressing Jews, why does he not discuss Kabbalistic notions? such as Shechina or other Sfirot in Tama Tami. In addition, an intriguing consideration is again related to the question of language. 
you recall I mentioned that Postel translated the original Hebrew version of Tamatamim into Latin. Should we see this as further evidence for the assumption that the Hebrew version was indeed intended for Jews, and therefore Postel felt the need later on to make it accessible for Christians as well? And if so, why? Or perhaps vice versa. The Hebrew version was originally intended for Christian Hebrewists, and he decided to render it in Latin only after seeing that in its Hebrew version it would not achieve its goal. Um, I cannot know for sure. But let me nevertheless express a few of my thoughts on the matter. First, I am not at all certain that Postel himself had a very clear vision about his intentions, <laughs> nor that he closely examined the different means for achieving his goal before its composition. Uh, the practice of writing such a treatise uh, in the Hebrew might have had other meanings and significances for him. He might have wanted to experience the sort of writing in Hebrew without the hope of it becoming influential or widespread. As to this, uh, his specific choice to avoid any clear references to Kabbalistic notions, this could, have been a, this could be attributed to prudence, a sign of his awareness that not all Jews are inclined toward Kabbalah. All things considered, I feel we're entitled to leave the issue of Tamatamim's target audience open, assuming that at least to a certain extent, this was also how Postel himself felt regarding his work. In addition, Postel's uh, vehement criticism of the Pope and the papacy, and his general negative depiction of the contemporary Christian world, should be understood, in my opinion, not as a rhetorical means uh, for the placation of his Jewish readers, but as genuine expression of his messianic and missionary stand. <coughs> Since, in fact, Tamat Amin is not an attempt to persuade Jews to become Catholic, but rather an attempt to persuade them to join Postel in his messianic revolution, which was not destined to become part of the Catholic structure, but to form a new version of universal Catholicism. This new universal Christianity is meant to completely reject the existing uh, religious political order with its many defects, and most prominently, the papacy replacing it with a restituted order led by an angelic pope and a universal king. In the same manner, one should, one should understand Postel's presentation of his theological and messianic ideas not in contradistinction to Jewish concepts, but as criticism of the existing Catholic orders, order. So it seems that he did not see any uh, significant difference between Jews and Christians as long as they rejected the deficiency of the existing Catholic order. Indeed, According to Postel's historical scheme, both the Jewish age and the Christian age are doomed to fail and vanish, and are to be replaced by a fourth age, which is neither Jewish nor Christian, but Kabbalistic. To conclude, Tamat Amin should be seen, in my opinion, as a book of Postelian mission, intended to persuade both Jews and Christians of Postel's universal and para-Catholic program. This also explains why Tamat Amin was first written in Hebrew and later on translated into Latin. It was because the book in its innermost essence is directed to these two audiences alike, and that these were the two rivers he had hoped would eventually flow into, into the universal ocean of the Messianic age, the ocean of oral law or Kabbalah, under the rule of a female angelic pope and a French monarch. Also. This, this unique postillion uh, religious messianic stage, uh, state sorry, has in itself the quality of conversion. The world is converted from one age into another. The existence is converted from overt masculinity to a femininity concealing the male within. Man experiences inner conversion into a sinless mode. Postel, as the leader of this age, went through a mystical conversion he called Imutatio in Latin and Khalifa in Hebrew. Its angelic pope is a Christ converted into a woman. And hermeneutically, this feminine age will be characterized by a dynamic and anthropocentric interpretation of scripture through Kabbalistic tools in a way that will not only convert scripture into its true meaning, but will issue a new hermeneutic reality of constant interpretation or interpretationality so to speak, based on human ingenuity. This new and converted messianic reality is therefore not only the goal or end of this kind of conversion, it is also, it's also the inner nature of that messianic reality itself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much.
Uh, our next speaker is uh, Uven Amitai. He is uh, Eliyahu Ella, professor of Islamic history at the Hebrew University and specializes in the late medieval history of the Middle East and neighboring areas. He is particularly interested in the history of Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt and Syria and of the Mon Mongol Ilkhanate in Iran and adjacent countries, as well as the history of medieval Palestine and processes of uh, Islamization. Among his recent publication, Holy War and Reproachment, and uh, studies in the relation between the Mamluk Sultanate and the Mongol Ilkhanate, 1260-1335, uh, and another co-edited with Michal Biran, Nomads as Agents of Cultural Change, the Mongols and the uh, Orissian uh, predecessors, and another co-edited with uh, Christoph uh, Kluth, Slavery and the Slave Trade in the Eastern Mediterranean, 11th to 15th century forthcoming. Uh, he will speak uh, uh, about where have all the Sufis gone, some comments, on the Islamization of the Turks and in Central Asia in the 10th century. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for being here. It's a great challenge to uh, keep you all from being converted to sleeping from uh, that one half an hour after lunch is finished. So uh, I'll do what I can. Um, and um, from a very, very sophisticated and sublime discussion, we're going to something rather mundane, I think, Central Asia, leaving Europe and we're heading, heading east. Um, so uh, the ongoing encounter between the ever-growing Muslim community and uh, the peoples of the Eurasian steppe, speaking of the Turks and eventually the Mongols too, this has been one of the most important events, if something can call an event, an event that lasts a thousand years, an event, but in Middle Eastern and Islamic history since the rise of Islam. And one only has to recall the saying, the Hadith, which is attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, Okay. Okay. So uh, you can read along with me. Leave the Turks alone as long as they leave you alone. To begin to realize the, the importance of these people, first the Turks, and then their cousins, the Mongols, uh, in the history of the region. And those of you who know Arabic will see a very nice little pun here too, uh, which I won't go into. Now, already uh, the great Hungarian and Jewish uh, scholar of Islamic studies, one of the founding fathers of Islamic studies, Goldseer, uh, more than 100 years ago, drew attention to this, to this hadith, to this saying, but he greatly doubted its authenticity, but he alluded to the importance of its importance, meaning, of course, that early on, the Muslims were intrigued by and concerned with the Turks coming from the steppes of Inner Asia. And these could be Khazars uh, north of the Caucasus, Turkish and other Turkish tribes, and Transoxiania and adjacent areas, or Turkish military slaves known as Mamluks or Ghulams in Baghdad. Another great scholar of the Islamic Middle East, the late Israeli historian David Ayalon, presented a cogent scheme to better understand the significance of this encounter between Central Asia and the Islamic world uh, since the beginning, uh, since the, the, the ninth century. Okay, uh, just to make press point out, so. The, the steps, of course, this doesn't seem to be working very well. The steps, of course, stretch from uh, Mongolia of today all the way across the north of the Black Sea to uh, Hungary. But the area we're really going to be dealing with is, this doesn't seem to be working, uh, but just um, north of this area, Bukhara and Samarkand, that's Transoxiania, and the steppe area is north of that. Now, I alone scheme about the coming of the European steppe peoples can be basically divided into three, three steps, uh, military slavery, which you, we can call Mamlukhood if you wish, starting in the early 9th century and lasting for a thousand years well into the 19th century. Uh, the migration of Turkish tribes known as Turkmen um, in the early 7th century, more or less initially led by the Seljuk family, and then of course that's in the 11th century, and then the coming of the Mongols starting in uh, their first invasion led by Chinggis Khan in 1219 to Transoxiania and northeast Iran, and continuing in various forms, Mongol rule continuing in various forms for at least another two centuries, and one could even claim a little bit later. So these are the three, the three stages according to Ayalon. I will make two points. One, of course, is that the, um, before we even have encounters on the frontier areas that I mentioned before, in different, different fronts, if you wish, uh, the difference is, of course, that they, they were not coming yet, that the peoples of Central Asia, the Turks, were not coming into the Islamic world, but they were certainly in, in, in interacting uh, with, 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 the, with the Muslim state and the Muslims. 
Um, and of course, I want to emphasize that these are not one step, but they begin long stages. And they, again, Mamlukhood, if you wish, or military slavery, exists in various forms for a thousand years. And, and, and Turkish tribes will come in for hundreds of years. And, and the Mongols will be moving back and forth in various, in various ways for more than 200 years. So these are long-term long -term developments. Now, uh, one, I think, particular area we're studying this is the uh, conversion of these tribes or these groups, uh, at least many of them or most of them, uh, that in each stage we have individuals and groups converting to uh, uh, Islam. And one can even talk about um, three stages. If you wish, look at the three stages. Okay, and here are modes of con con conversion with a nod to Nehemiah the late Nehemiah Lepzion. Um, with uh, military slaves, of course, were plucked out of the pagan background and brought to the centers of the Islamic world, and there they were converted. Oh, they were converted along the way, or they were converted when they finally got there. Nobody asked them. Um, it was, uh, in a sense, the Muslims were kind of an in locus parentis, um, and by, given a basic Islamic education. Turkish tribes from the 11th century, which I'm going to be concentrating on today, uh, conversion was in the Eurasian steppe before they came into the Islamic world, and the Mongols. Uh, conquered mostly as pagans with some Christian and other influences, uh, conquered the Eastern Islamic world, including Iran and Iraq and, and Anatolia, and eventually converted white in the Islamic world. Um, and so we have uh, we have three different types of three different models, if you wish, three different approaches. Uh, Leptione suggested two types of Islamization: um, group and, and collective, or group on the one hand, individual. I see I see this in both in all three of these stages. I see one can find examples of that. Uh, and perhaps we can talk about that during during the um, during the uh, questions. Well, I'm going to concentrate on this during this lecture on the conversion process of the what became the Turkmen tribes as they came into the Islamic world. They were called Turkmen, but still, while they're in the steps, uh, or actually uh, the stages just before it, before the conversion, uh, the north, northwest, and northeast of Transoxiana, which the uh, Arabs will refer to. Uh, again, you can see the map and smack in the middle, and I hope you can see some are kind of Bukhara because the the spotter here doesn't really work very well. Here we go. Samarkand and Bukhara. That's Transoxiana. So the area north of it, what is called in Arabic Mawar Anar, what is uh, on the other side, what's behind uh, the Oxus River, if you wish. Okay, so uh, Transoxiana, Bukhara, Samarkand, and the group that we're going to be dealing with are the Ouz, Ouyuz, Tur Turks which are referred to as rules in Arabic and Persian, and that's how I'm going to be calling them, calling them too. I think that's just the easiest way to uh, refer to them. Um, now, let me just state that uh, I already have some disagreement with some of what is accepted in and traditional scholarship about the uh, conversion, um, that um, an earlier generation of scholars suggested that Sufis, Muslim mystics, played a major uh, role in, uh, in, uh, in, in the initial religious transformation of the pagan Turks, and I will be talking about what their paganism actually represented in just a minute or two. Um, now, they were successful, according to this, uh, this theory or this approach, due to their presence, their charisma, their down-to-earth approach, and even their similarity to, to so-called similarity to traditional Turkish shamans. Now, the, uh, the, the, uh, I guess the founding fathers, so to speak, of this approach among the early giants of, of the study of Islamic history, on the one hand, we have Kokrulu, um, uh, uh, and on the other hand, we have Bar Bartold Kokrulu, the founder of the study of, uh, we can call him the, the, the founder of a scientific or scholarly study of history in Turkey, and an important politician, died in 1966, and of course the great Bartold, uh, who died in 1930. Um, now, this idea has been picked up by many scholars and still found. Um, let me just give you one example to, again, set the stage a little bit. Peter Golden, an important, a very, very important scholar, uh, writing in 1990 and elsewhere, um, this pressure to convert to Islam, talking, of course, about the tribes of Central Asia, was reinforced by the activities of the Muslim mystics, the Sufis, who journeyed to, to the steps of uh, the steppe tribes to preach and propagate the new faith. These dynamic, charismatic, and largely still anonymous personalities who rese whose resemblance to the shamans of the Turkic society may not have been entirely coincidental, hedging his bets, won many converts with their theory rhetoric. So he suggests, well, I'm, uh, um, um, I, I, I disagree with this, and I've written about this, but, but I, I want to say that, that, um, that um, again, the Sufis and shamans and ulama who will be talking about too, the scholars, the legal scholars and other types of religious scholars, 
Um, a number of scholars have begun to call this into question, and I first, of course, have to mention the great work of Wilfred Madelung. He mentioned it actually in a footnote, uh, but it's a very important footnote in one of his uh, works, and this has been picked up by Karo Mustafa and uh, Devin Devis, uh, and I, I, I tried to deal with it a little bit. Um, and I think that, um, I'm being very, very specific, I'm talking about the area north of Transoxiana, the steppe area, these Turks in the 10th century, I'm not trying to claim that, shaman, that Sufis had a role some later along down the line and elsewhere, but we're talking about the, the initial encounter of the, the, the Turkish tribes in this area, and, and um, I, I don't find Sufis, I, I mentioned this very, very briefly when I was here um, two or three months ago, uh, then I gave a talk about the Mongols, now I'm going to talk about the 10th, 11th century, 10th century Turks, and if you invite me back again, I'll talk about the Mamluks at the beginning of the, uh, their, their, their conversion. So, um, but in the meantime, here we are, and uh, I would, what I'm going to do, um, we should try to draw at least a basic picture of a traditional um, Turkish pre-Islamic pagan Turkish religion, which there's a certain continuity that goes back before the Turks, and it certainly continues after the Turks, and one finds a great sense of continuity with the Mongols who are going to be uh, appearing on the historical stage a century or two later. Um, what I'm going to do now, and of course, all kinds of influences besides in, in Central Asia and Inner Asia in the, among the steppe population, not just the traditional religion, and one can mention Nestorian Christianity, Buddhism, Manichaeism, and even Judaism, as we well know, in the, among the Khazars, and perhaps even in, in directly on the, on the Ruz themselves. But I'm going to leave all that in the background and concentrate on the traditional paganistic religion. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, make a couple citations from the, um, uh, an Arab writer named Ibn Fadlan, who had traveled as part of a delegation. It was a delegation from the Caliphate to the Bulgars. Now, of course, most of us know that the Bulgars, some of them eventually end up in the Balkans, and they undergo a process of Christianization and Slavification. But the mainstay of the Bulgars were Turkish-speaking people who stayed in the Volga region until the 14th century, when they disappeared from the historical stage. Now, uh, he's there on the way to the Bulgars, and the Bulgars have already converted to Islam, and I'm not going to deal with the Bulgars, that's an interesting question, how did they become Muslims? We'll leave that for another lecture too. But in the meantime, as this delegation is moving across the steppe from, from, from Bukhara and Samarkand, and they're moving across the steppe, they reach the Volga, um, they encounter all these tribesmen, these Wuz tribesmen, and uh, Ibn Fadlan is their, one of their secretaries, and luckily, not only was there, he also left us a memoir of about 50 or 60 pages, which is a very important, has a lot of important things also to say about the Khazars, but we're not going to talk about that today. Um, let me just, I made a mistake here, and I hope I can go back. Yeah, okay. So he, this is a quote from Ibn, Ibn Fadlan, and he's kind of uh, playing the would-be anthropologist here. We reached a Turkish tribe that is called the Gulus of Ruz. They are nomads and have tents of filth. They stay for a time in one place and then travel on. One sees their dwelling place placed here and there according to nomadic customs. That's it makes sense as far as it goes. Now, I'm going to say that not everybody agrees with this translation of mine, but we're going to follow it for the time being. They do not worship anything, but they, but they call their great ones, Kuparab, and I think referring to spirits here, as Lord Arbab. When one of them consults his chief, Raiz, regarding a matter, he, the chief, points to the spirit and says, Oh Lord, what should I do in such and such a matter? And this is like actually a shamanistic, this is what you do, you ask shamans to, to intervene with the spirits of, of, of the dead and, and the various gods to get information, to get advice. Okay, now um, this is a, uh, an interesting topus here too. Um, it says here also they are in a wretched state as if they are lost wild asses. They do not worship anything. And this is an interesting topus that we find uh, throughout both Muslim and Christian writing about the nomads of Central Asia that if they're not Christians and they're not Jews and they're not Muslims and they're not Buddhists, then they really don't have any religion because they, they, it was almost unfathomable. We talked about cognitive dis, dis, dissonance before between Native Americans in, in the Paraguay and, and, and Franciscans or, or, or Jesuits. So uh, here's the same, um, I guess they really don't know what they're, they're different, they're talking completely, diff difficulty understanding each other. Okay, but uh, um, this is something that comes up again with the Mongols. Under the Mongols, both Armenian writers and Western Christian writers, as well as Muslims, can't figure out what the Muslims believe in, the Mongols believe in until they can begin to convert to one of the monotheistic religions or Buddhism. Well, continuing on with Ibn Fadlan, okay, um, he says here, when one of them, the Guz, is, is wrong and something happens to him in which he hates, 
he raises his head to the sky and, and says, Bir Tengri, or as it's written in Arabic, Bir Tankri. This in Turkish means one God, since Bir in Turkish is one, and Tengri is God, Allah. That's the way he translates it, okay, in the language of the Turks. Now, this is a very interesting little piece of information. We see clearly the equivalence of the Turkish Tengri with the Muslim Allah. Now, this would have some implications, I think, for the transition from the traditional Turkish religion to Islam. Tengri can mean both the physical heavens and, and the god or godliness embodied in them. And there are lots of other gods too, but he's the most important of the gods. And there, therefore, there seems to be some parallel between Bir Tengri and the one god of Islam. Although, again, the former is still distant from the monotheistic concept found in the latter. In addition, the terms also provide some continuity. If the polytheistic Turks, or at least those who are speaking to them among the Muslims, could refer to the main god as Allah, thus it's not paved the way for accepting a monotheistic god known by the same name. So that's um, one, one little thing to add to the equation here. But I rush ahead, because uh, this is really precious information of the nature regarding the Oghuls or Turkish paganism. Their shamans are briefly mentioned, as is the sky god, the sky god Tengri, the most important of their divine pantheon. In general, the geographic literature of this time, the 8th and 9th century, which mentions the Turks extensively, but doesn't deal very much with their religion. Uh, basically, besides, they talk a lot about weather magic, the ability to make rainstorms, hailstorms, snowstorms, particularly to cause discomfort to the enemy in battle. Um, so, um, and we find that in a lot, but not a whole lot about the religion, we have to say. But um, let me just quote two well-known pieces of evidence um, regarding early conversion of the Turkish nomads in the central part of the steppe of Islam. Interestingly, both written by, or these, 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 these evidence is conveyed to us by later, later writers. Um, unlike even Fadlan, who is writing things in real time, as he records them, as he understands them, these are written later. There's a story related by Ibn al athir who died in 1233, so we're two or three centuries later, of the Karakhanid ruler Satik Bugra Khan. The Karakhanid set up their state in this, in this area a little bit later, 950, 960, they're Turkish nomads who convert to Islam, um, but um, this is a generation or so after the events I'm describing now with Ibn Fadlan. Okay, so uh, he converted, uh, he's the first ruler of his dynasty to convert to Islam. He adopts a Muslim public policy, including fighting against the infidels and his relatives even, and encouraging conversion to Islam among the tribesmen. Um, this, of course, this fits what a new. This is what a newly uh, 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 converted ruler is supposed to do, um, and certainly later Muslim sources would want to per project him in this in this form. Um, another later 13th century source, Jamal Karshi, writing in the Mongol uh, Khanid of Central Asia, uh, so he's a Central Asian source, but he's much later again, writes that Satuk's conversion was facilitated by a member of the Samanid family. The Samanids were the state south. In, in Bukhara and Samarkand and Khorasan. So one of them was a renegade. He had fled to the steppe, but he's the one who actually converts, converts him. Um, so we have a member of the political establishment, even if he's kind of a renegade member of the political establishment. Um, another story uh, related by the story a little bit earlier. Okay, um, let me just write this here. One second. Here we go. That makes it a little easier. So we have Ibn al Athir, the name of the Karahadid prince, Jamal Karshi, our second source, a Samanid uh, Sian. And then we have, uh, uh, sorry, it should be a, it's a mistake, Al Miskawahi, uh, who died a little bit, a little bit uh, earlier, in 1030, that he writes, shortly after Sartuk's death, this is a mass conversion of 200,000 tents, or 200,000 households to Islam. Now we have no details whatsoever about the circumstances or even the location, of, or, 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 or what, how, how this, where did this fantastic number come from? Um, but it does imply that it did happen under the Karakhan. So here we see something from the top down. The, uh, the, the prince uh, converts and uh, then is followed by the conversion of tribesmen. What does this conversion mean? What did they know about Islam? Why did they do it? What did they practice? What did they do with their old traditional faith? These are big questions which are left in the air. It may be that among these tribesmen were also Wu's tribesmen, uh, but this remains speculation. But in Ninth century, we uh, but later in the ninth century, we have some further cases of conversion with smaller numbers, which make a lot more sense, a lot more credible. But I'm not going to delve into those. I'm going to go back a generation again, go back to Ibn Fadlan, and tell he tells us something about some some initial meetings between Muslims and um, Muslims and and, and 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 tribesmen. Okay, so back to Ibn Fadlan. 
So this is, a, this is um, here we go. Before arriving in the land of the Ghuls, Ibn Fadlan converses with a Turk of unknown origin accompanying the caravan. There are a lot of Turks um, around. Uh, a Turkish Mamluk from Baghdad here, another Turk. So he was speaking both Arabic and Turkish, so he was already part of the Khalifa delegation, translates for our author, who, er, everybody's complaining how incredibly cold it is. And it's the middle of the winter in Central Asia, so it's obviously very, very cold. And so uh, uh, Takin, that was the name of this particular, uh, Takin, this particular Mamluk, okay, he, he laughs and tells even Fadan that one of the Turks had asked him, what does our Lord Rab want from us? For he is killing us with this cold. For we, if we knew what he wanted, we would tell him to, we would bring it to him. And even Fadan tells the, the Takin, tells this, 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 this Mamluk, to tell the Turk, the unnamed Turk, tell him that Allah wants you to say only la Allah ila Allah. The Turk laughed and said, if I knew it, I would say it, okay? So that's interesting. Um, so, um, uh, um, no anti-Islamic feelings are expressed here by the Turks, by the unnamed, by the pagan Turk. The Lord of the Turks and that of the Muslims, meaning God, is seen more or less as the same, okay? At the same time, the Turk in question has certainly not yet converted in any way. He states or offends in ignorance of the Shahada, la ilaha illa Islam. Yet concurrently, he's willing to give it a try, so he says, yet he's not ready to convert, but he's certainly keeping an open mind. Okay. Now, even Fadlan returns to this matter of, uh, of, of Islam and the Turks a little bit later. Okay. I have heard them say, meaning the Turks, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Thus, hoping to draw close to someone from among the Muslims who had come, not because they believed in it. Okay? So, this is also practical considerations. Get the Turks to mimic the Muslims. Perhaps, we, remember, we are dealing with traders here. Trade, mostly traders and, and delegations. And thus, to ingratiate themselves with them. So, I think that is in this spirit we need to read the following anecdote, too. This is Ibn, Ibn Fadlan's final anecdote, at least the one I'm bringing. One of them heard me reciting the Quran, and he found this reading of the Quran pleasing. He went and told the translator, tell him not to be quiet. The man told me one day via the translator, say to this Arab, referring to Ibn Fadlan, is our Lord, may he be powerful and magnificent, a woman, this is apropos to our discussion before, I regarded this as presumptuous, and I said, praise to God and ask his forgiveness, ask God's forgiveness. Okay, the Turks had praised to God and also asked for forgiveness, as I had done. It is a Turkish custom whenever they hear a Muslim say praise to God or la ilaha illallah to say like that. So there's an ongoing process, interesting process of mimicry. So again, we see the tribesmen and, and the tribesmen and perhaps the tribesmen, they appear to enjoy the Muslim ceremonies without really understanding them. The recitation of the Quran interests him and, imitates, and he imitates some basic formulae and expressions. At the same time, his understanding of Muslim dogma appears to be pretty minimal. As seen by the question that one asked even Fadlan, I wonder if he was, he was just trying to annoy him. That, that could possibly be too. Um, now, our author then gives further accounts of, uh, of various customs among the Ghuls, uh, marriage, gender, washing, slaughter of animal, male homosexuality, and he discusses at great length the complicated trading relations between Muslim merchants and Ghuls tribesmen, showing that these meetings uh, were commonplace and based on mutual trust. Ibn Fadlan then tells the first school's prince who had become a Muslim. However, this prince had been told by his tribesmen that if you converted to Islam, you could no longer rule us. Thus, he rescinded his conversion to Islam, wa raja'a min islamihi. Okay, which is interesting. Um, um, we'll get to the conclusions in a second. Okay. Um, and, um, uh, Okay, this had happened before the Khalifa delegation actually met him. So this is what Ibn Fadlan is hearing when he finally meets this 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 this, this prince, this, this minor prince. Okay, so uh, the, the prince initially gave the delegation some difficulties, but eventually permitted them to pass into his territories. And and this, this contains some interesting points. This short passage: the, the Ghuls had somehow become this Ghuls prince at least had somehow become a Muslim, and we were not told who influenced him and who helped him convert. But without too much compunction, he gave it up. Uh, so whatever the motivations of his conversion, it was clear that the new faith had yet to sit very heavy with him. Secondly, for the tribesmen, it was hitherto unacceptable that their leader would accept this religion, which means I presume that they were remaining faithful to their paganistic, traditional shamanistic beliefs. For all of their interest of some Ghuls tribesmen in Islamic formulae and, and, and the above mimicry that I described, uh, many were still not ready to consider or accept conversion to Islam. Thirdly, we see that in this case, at least conversion to Islam was actually politically unwise and weakened the prince's position. 
Now, this makes contradicts, or at least partially contradicts, the suggestion of some scholars that there must have invariably be practical political reasons behind the conversion of a step ruler. It adds legitimization, supposedly, and enables political centralization, perhaps, maybe, but here's an example, a counterexample, if you wish. Okay, now we can also note that even Fadan and his companions, they took this all in stride. They didn't try to, of course, the, the prince was theoretically a mortad, a renegade from Islam, and of course he should have been condemned and even sentenced to death. But I, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to wrap it up. Okay, so we're not going to, so they didn't sentence him to death and they moved on. That was the politic thing to do. Now, let me draw a few conclusions here. Um, or not. Okay, now, um, Perhaps uh, there was some occasional conversion uh, among the Ghouls in the early 10th century, but no serious inroads. We have only the exception, again, the early, um, the early um, 10th century. We have the one example, this one prince. We have ex plenty of examples of people who are coming into contact with, with Islam, but <coughs> clearly have yet to convert. The Ghouls, the tribesmen, have begun to become acquainted with Islam at this time, and they were beginning to imitate rituals. Okay, I find absolutely no Sufis. There's none around. And, and again, Madalong has gone into this, and he, he very clearly proved that people who were suggested to be Sufis and traveling into Central Asia were not Sufis, but ulama. Um, and um, I think the main thing is, which perhaps wasn't expressed as clearly as perhaps I could have, but the traders are there. They're the ones who are coming into contact. There's a very intensive trading network back and forth between the Persian-speaking areas of Transoxiana and, and the steppe and all kinds of slaves were going, slaves and furs were going in one direction, Finnish goods were going in the other direction. A lot of a lot of stuff was 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 going on. So um, to wrap it up, I I I, um, um, I I I think if we could look for agents of Islamization, um, it's the, it's the, mainly the merchants. They were the source of inspiration for the imitation. Um, by the um, by the um, by uh, inspiration for the beginning, the acquaintance with Islam, um, the riches that the merchants brought, and the desire to trade with them, or somehow to be involved in this trade, what might have helped promote the merchants as mediators between the tribal society and Islam. We find other these these the, the, the Salman and Sian on the one hand uh, may have played a role, and also perhaps ulama. Um, this here call to Islam may have been accompanied by an implicit or explicit message of political power, perhaps wealth. Um, we had already seen that the Bulgars had converted to Islam, and this also may have been a way of their inflating their cousins with, with, um, um, with, with Islam. Uh, the Sufis were thin on the ground and found it all, and there's no reason to think of them, those in Transoxonia or Khorasan at this time, as antinomian or even compromising on the basic rules of Islam uh, at this point. Uh, it's a point made by Madhul, as mentioned above, and, and this supposedly more attractive as so-called post-shamanism to the still uh, pagan Turks. So what we have here is the, the Seljuk, the, the myth, semi-mythical father of the Seljuk family, converts probably in the middle of the 10th century. It's a generation or so after the events I'm describing here. We have a snapshot, so to speak, of initial acquaintance. It's not yet conversion, but it's preparing the way for conversion. Uh, and of course, two generations later, the grandsons of, 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 of Seljuk are, are, are assaulted. One of them is assaulted in Baghdad. So uh, it's, quick, it's clear that things can move rather quickly. I have far from exhausted the subject. How, what, what did the new converts, the converts understand of Islam? What rituals did they adopt? How did, did they abandon the rituals of the previous religion? Um, how were they reconciled? If not, if they didn't abandon them, and of course, uh, how did the Seljuk leaders adopt a normative form of, of Islam, along with Sunni Muslim political culture? These are uh, and how did this influence the relationship with the tribes? And these are all important and big questions which have, have received some attention. They can receive more attention. Um, so I think we've made some progress with understanding some aspects of the Islamization of, of the tribesmen of Inner Asia. But we have still have more work to go, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, absent uh, speaker is uh, Daphne Efrat. Uh, her lecture will be read by Professor Limot Horvitz. Uh, Daphne Efrat is Associate Professor of Islamic and Near Eastern History at the Department of History, Philosophy and Judaic Studies of the Open University of Israel. Her research focuses on the social history of pre and modern religious groups, institutions. Her publications include a learned society in the period of transition on the religious scholars of the 11th century Baghdad and spiritual wafers, 
leaders in deity on the Sufism of medieval Palestine. Daphna is also a co-author of the OUP series on Islam and a co-editor for Religious Knowledge, Authority and Charisma. Currently, she is working on a new project on the creation of saintly spheres in Syria in the age of the Crusade. Please. Thank you. Two weeks ago, Daphna was informed that she can't be present here and that she was kind enough to send us her lecture and I will uh, read it. And she moves us forward about 200 years to a period where we start finding Sufis in contrast to what Ruben was talking about. Um, and the topic is Sufi saints and the making of Christian converts in medieval Syria and Anatolia. In his monumental introduction to Mukadima, the celebrated historian and philosopher Ibn Khaldun defines a saintly miracle, Karama, as a divine power that arouses the soul, the ability to exercise influence. The worker of miracles is supported by his activity by the Spirit of God. That is, miracles are performed by good persons for good purposes and that are entirely devoted to good deeds. That's a quotation from Ibn Khaldun, and now we start with the lecture. <coughs> Hagiographical narratives that display saintly marvels must have arose from a variety of motives that designed to highlight varied functions of these good and influential persons. Yet their identification as Muslim mystics, known as Sufis, is common in hagiographical traditions produced in various parts of the medieval Muslim world, and the ability of these friends of God to exercise their spiritual power appears to be vital not only to the dissemination and solidification of Islam, but to conversion to Islam in general. This is particularly true with regard to mystics and holy men who carry the main burden of the spread of Islam among infidels in the further Islamic lands, such as Indonesia and South Asia, the Asian land of Kashmir. No less significant was the role of Sufi saints as promoters of conversion from Christianity in the central Islamic lands. Examples of these are Syria and Anatolia, where Muslims achieved political predominance by military conquest. Here I seek to offer observations on the role of medieval Sufi saints as agents of conversion of Christians in medieval Syria and Anatolia, and the relationship of hagiography to history by focusing on the vitas of two renowned Sufi saints. The first is the Kitab Nakib, Kitab Nakib al Sheikh Abdallah al Yunini, the Book of Life and Virtues of the Sheikh Abdallah al Yunini, known as the Lion of the Levant, who lived in the village of Yunni, in the vicinity of Baalbek, in Lebanon Valley, in the late 12th and early 13th century. The second is the Vilayet Nameh, the Book of Sainthood of Haji Bektash, perhaps the most famous of all Turkish Sufis known as Dervishes. He left his hometown in eastern Iran in advance of the Mongol invasions in the mid-13th century and settled in central Anatolia near the modern city of Kirshahir. The authors of these saintly vidas of these Sufi sheikhs composed their works after the periods they described. Ahmad ibn Uthman, the author of the saintly vita of Sheikh Abdallah al yunini composed his work in the early 18th century. According to his testimony, he was an associate of one of the Sheikh's descendants and recorded the stories that passed in oral and written forms from members of his family, his spiritual descendants and companions. The accounts about Yunini's heroic virtues as a patron saint against external enemies and tyrants are numerous. Episodes about the conversion of non-Muslims in his hands are rare, even though his Saint Vita is replete with accounts that illustrate the enactment of his spiritual power in the public sphere to disseminate true faith, intervene with the ruling authorities on behalf of whole towns, and cater to the needs of members of local communities, among them indigenous Christians. The Vilayat Nameh of Haji Bektash is one of the central texts associated with traditions of the Qtashi Sufi order. The work by an anonymous author was probably first set down in writing in the late 15th century. It has consistently been written over the centuries in Persian, Turkish, and Greek, 
probably in order to appeal to all Anatolians. The lives of Anatolian dervish leader and his disciples are replete with historical and semi-legendary accounts of conversion of Greeks, Armenians, and Jews. Vilayat Nameh is thoroughly missionary in spirit, often taking place in the realm of fantasy and miracle. Even so, the, controver the conversionary incidents incorporated in this central text have in fact a solid historical kernel and a symbolic or cultural truth. Islamic hagiography is our richest source for observing the precise claims and functions of a holy man in a given community. Authors of hagiographical, hagiographical accounts naturally vary in presentation of subjects, their narrative voices, and the strategies they employed to generate meaning for their audiences. Yet, only by depicting the Sufi saint within a specific community of believers could the norms he embodied and the message he spread be effective. As such, his persona needed to be concretized and placed within a particular environment. This probably accounts for the fact that his exemplary life and miraculous deeds are abundant with scenes from the life of local communities. Beyond the legendary layer and idealizing terms and expressions, there thus exist details about the life of the charismatic chefs and accounts about their functions within Sufi circles and in public spheres. These accounts must have been shaped no less by the concerns and expectations of fellow believers than by the intentions, beliefs, and imaginations of those who passed them on and put them into writing. The Vita of Sheikh Abdallah Yunini affords the reader numerous examples of his heroic virtues. Episodes about the conversion of non-Muslims in his hands are rare, even though his Vita is replete with accounts that illustrate the enactment of his spiritual power in the public sphere. This power included the ability to disseminate true faith, intervene with the authorities on behalf of whole towns, and provide for the material needs of members of local communities, among them indigenous Christians. The hagiographical accounts recorded in these works shed light on the diverse versions of Islam disseminated by these saints. Their conversionary methods and the importance they and their followers ascribe to conversion as manifestation of charismatic authority. Moreover, the conversion tales help us reconstruct the motivations of both the converters and the converted, the meanings of conversion, as well as commonalities and differences in conversion dynamics across regions and periods. Abdallah Yunini lived in Syria during the counter-crusader period, which was marked by an overall intense religious attitude and vigor. He himself took an active part in the ongoing confrontations with the Crusades from the side of Salah Adin, the famous jihad leader. His biographer described him as a courageous warrior, as well as a paragon of virtue, renowned for his reverence, asceticism, and upright behavior. Like other traditionalist Sufis of his time, Yunini participated in the movement known as the Sunni Revival, which aspired to revive the prophetic legacy by enacting the Quranic principle of commanding and prohibiting wrong. Pointing to, the, to their superior mystical knowledge and moral conduct, these Sufis claim to be the most qualified to cleanse the public sphere of improper conduct, such as drinking and selling wine and eating forbidden food. It is in the framework of this larger scheme that they spurred their fellow believers to forsake their old life and become better Muslims and their Christian neighbors to turn away from their faith. As such, the hagiographical narratives of conversion in the hands of the Sufi friends of God could serve as another testimony to his virtues and spiritual power. This point is well illustrated in the following story on the encounter between Abdallah al yunini and a Christian wine seller that led to the conversion in the handoff of the Sheikh and the miracle worker. And now I quote the story. Jamal al-Din al yaqub the judge of the town of Karak al -Bikka, Lebanon Valley, related, once I saw Sheikh Abdallah, God be blessed with him, performing ablution in the river Torah, 
close to the white bridge in Damascus, when a Christian passed by him, and with him was a mule carrying wine. All of a sudden, the animal stumbled on the bridge, and the, and the load fell down. I then saw the sheikh who had finished the ablution. This was a very hot day. No one beside me and the sheikh was on the bridge at that time. The sheikh approached me and said, Come here, O jurist. Help us place this load on the animal. And so I did. The Christian mounted the mule and embarked on his way. I was overwhelmed by this deed of the sheikh and followed the Christian and his mule as I was heading to the city. The Christian took the animal to the Damascene neighborhood of Okaba and went to a cellar of wine there. The cellar started to inspect the load and to his great amazement found that it contained vinegar, not wine. The Christian burst into tears and said, I swear to God, this was wine. Now I know where it comes from. He then tied his mule to a nearby rest house, where Han, and set the foot to the mosque. Upon entering the mosque, he observed the sheikh, who had already performed the midday prayer and was engaged in praises of Almighty God. The Christian came near him and said, O oh my master, I embrace Islam as my creed. I testify, there is no God but Allah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And from that time forward, he became a pious ascetic and virtuous believer. Making deviants and non-Muslims embrace true religion must have acquired a significant meaning during the lifetime of Dalai Nini, a period marked by energetic efforts to restore Islamic supremacy and revive the legacy of the Prophet. At the same time, conversion in the Sheikh's hands reflects the widespread belief in the existence of holy figures. These persons were thought capable of deploying the divine grace with which they are blessed to avert calamities, pursue justice, and cater to the religious and material needs of devout believers. We may assume that the Greek Orthodox, who, more than any other Eastern Christians, suffered under the Crusade rule, were attracted to such figures. Hajib Ektash settled in the, in the Anatolian Plateau during a period of severe external shocks and internal instability. The Seljuk Sultans of Rum brought the, bore the brunt Crusade in the late 11th century, but succeeded, but succumbed to the Mongol invasion in 1243 at the Battle of Kostag. For the remainder of the 13th century, until the consolidation of Ottoman rule in the late 15th century, central authority was replaced by tribal polities. This inaugurated a period of chaos and war that proved disastrous for Christian institutions, life, and religion. The isolated Greek church, which had undergone a gradual process of decline since the conquest of Anatolia by the Turkish tribes in the early 11th century, experienced the greatest difficulties. It was this anarchic environment that Sufi, it was in this anarchic environment that Sufis settled, established residences, built hospices and mills, stimulated agricultural cultivation, mediated disputes, and provided safety for travelers. Thus, the Anatolian Sufis brought order to, for, into fragmented societies. They provided local leadership to their fellow believers, but also furnished to Christians the charity, substance, and moral support that the church was no longer able to provide, and facilitated their conversion to Islam. Two Sufi orders played a significant role in the conversion of Anatolian Christians. The Mevlevis of Jamal al-Din al-Rumi, known as the Whirling Dervishes, and the Bektashis of Haji Bektash. The Mevlevis won converts in the towns. The Bektashis worked in rural and tribal milieus and became extremely popular throughout Anatolia. Authors of their sacred biographies attribute such conversionary success to the extraordinary personalities and marvelous deeds of these mystics. Such literary effort was probably intended to create, to credit the holy man with solidifying the faith in the region and legitimizing Islamic predominance there. No less significant was the version of Sufi understanding of Islam that these agents of conversion preached. 
The Medwebis were relatively conservative and orthodox in the principles and practices, promoted a version of Islam that stressed its universal aspects and tolerance towards and cooperation with all faiths. As for Haji Bektash and his followers, their missionary efforts were closely linked with a vision of Islam that synthesized Sunni and Shi'i beliefs and Muslim and Christian religious practices. To, do, to judge from the Wilayat Nameh of Haji Bektash, the Bektashis were fired by the desire to make converts, and their deliberate efforts were enhanced by the latitudinarian and syncretistic faith that they preached. The following passage from the Vilayat Nameh recounts a meeting between a wandering dervish and a monk. In the story, the dervish was sent by Haji Bektash to deliver wheat to the Christian monk who lived in a Christian province that was not yet taken by the Turks. The monk was allegedly a secret follower of Haji Bektash. The tale hints at the role played by Bektashi dervishes in creating new mixes of Christian and Muslims, medieval Anatolia, and reveals what might be promoting a crypto-religious phenomenon. And now is the story. Along the way, this dervish encountered many people who were suffering from the famine and who offered him large sums of money with some of the wheat, for some of the wheat. So he went, the dervish gave, so as he went, the, derv, the dervish gave in to the condition of these people and their attractive financial offers, selling much of the wheat and replacing it with straw and dust. Finally arriving at his destination, he turned the load over to the monk who entertained him with hospitality. Impressed by the hospitality that the infidel tendered him, the dervish thought to himself that this monk would actually become a Muslim. The monk divined the dervish's thought and informed him that he was already a Muslim, but he was afraid to be such a Muslim as the dervish, who had betrayed the trust of his master by selling some of the grain. The dervish suddenly felt, suddenly realized that he was dealing with a holy man and became much distressed at his own conduct. By then, it was time for church service and the Christians were entering the church. As soon as, as the service was over and the last Christian had left church, the monk accompanied by the dervish entered the church and closed the door securely behind him. He then lifted a stone slab, opened the door underneath it, and there came into a beautiful room which they entered. There lay a bundle of fine clothing, a tall dervish cap, and in a prayer niche, a reading stand with a Quran. The monk, to the great amazement of the dervish, donned the clothing and dervish cap and prayed before the mihras. Then he opened the Quran and began his recitation. Finally, he prayed once more, passed over his face, and informed the astonished dervish that he himself was a Bektashi dervish. When the religious ceremony was over, the dervish monk removed the dervish garb and put on again his Christian garment. Notably, the Islamization of Christians in Anatolia, especially in rural areas, was generally rather abbreviated. It is doubtful if more than a handful of converts received instruction in their new faith. Their conversion seems to have entailed no more than the doctrinal testimony, the Shahada, repetition of the Quran and prayers, circumcision, and perhaps new attire. At the same time, thanks to syncretism and conversion, Christian and pre-Christian practices, beliefs, and forms left important traces on the Islam that emerged in medieval Anatolia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker will be a respondent. Uh, it will be Sarah Sviri. Uh, professor Sviri is a professor emerita at the Department of Arabic and the Department of Comparative Religions in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Formerly, she taught at Tel Aviv University, the Department of Hebrew and Jewish Studies, at University College London and the University of Oxford, and for a short period 
at Ben Gurion University. Her fields of study include Islamic mysticism, mystical philosophy, comparative aspects of early Islam, uh, the formative period of Islamic mysticism, and the mystical wisdom of Ibn al-Arabi. She has published many academic articles on these topics, which can, can be viewed on the Academia Edu web website. Her book, uh, The Taste of Hidden Things, Images of the Sufi Past, was published in 1997 in the USA. In uh, 2008, her comprehensive Sufi ontology was published in Hebrew by Tel Aviv University Press. An Arabic version of the anthology was recently published by uh, Mansharat El Jamal in Beirut. She is currently preparing a monograph on early manifestations of Islamic mysticism. She lives and works in Israel and has two children and two grandchildren. Thank you very much. Uh, is the sound okay? Yeah. Yes, okay. So again, as uh, all persons who spoke before me, I'd like to thank. And especially I'd like to, to thank Nimrod Hovitz, who for whatever reason asked me to come and be the respondent, which is almost an impossible task, as you can imagine, uh, to bring together different topics like that. And what can I do with them exactly? I'll try my best. But in any case, thank you. And uh, the reason, really the reason why I couldn't say no was the fact that I have some nostalgia towards Ben Gurion University with which I had a rather short flirt for a couple of years. So here we are. Good, okay. So what did we have here in this panel? We had three papers. In my, to my mind, very, very inspiring and uh, challenging papers, but in very different areas. We had uh, Judith's paper on uh, Catholic missionary Kabbalah, if I may say so, something like that, uh, very special with, with a Hebrew text, uh, but it, at the same time it was about a period that I'm not at all uh, comfortable with or knowledgeable about and about the topic I like reading about Kabbalah uh, being interested in mysticism but I'm not um, a scholar of Kabbalah so that's one challenge an obstacle that I had to somehow um, uh, move over then we had uh, Ruben's paper which, which was based on a historical premise which you challenged. Uh, and I'd like to take it up, of course, but again, I'm not a historian as such, so it's also a challenge. And finally, uh, we had uh, Daphna's uh, paper based on uh, hagiographical literature, Sufi hagiographical literature, with which I'm really more comfortable. But there are things to say about this. Uh, my comfort is not necessarily uh, helpful here. Um, we'll see. Anyway, what combines uh, uh, the, these three papers was that they are about mystics helping or doing something towards conversion. Okay. Now, actually, I had a question in my mind, and I wanted to ask you that before the question starts, does uh, Postel actually use the, the word conversion uh, or not? Uh, you said at the end that he uses the word khalifa or something like that. And why do I ask this question? Because the um, um, term itself, the term that we use uh, for this conference and for papers written, uh, the term conversion is not so straightforward. Um, literally or simplistically, when we hear it, we say yes, it's the it's the transition of the khalifa from one religion to another, done specifically for this conference by some agents or people who try to change people from their original religion to another religion, but. Anyone who is familiar with Sufi texts, not only with Sufi texts, but particularly with Sufi texts, we know that in, in the Sufi parlance, the term for conversion, which is tawbah, 
means something else. It doesn't mean the change from one religion to another, but the change from a kind of um, state of mind which is, I don't know how to exactly describe it, but more or less mechanical or obedient and, and uh, automatic or something like that, to a state of mind which is awakened. And this transition for the two states of mind is called in the Sufi understanding Tauba. Tauba literally means um, repentance. But they use this term, Tauba, i.e. conversion, it's always translated as conversion, not as repentance in the orthodox traditional sense, but in this mystical or as uh, William James would have it as a psychological conversion of the heart. So I think, first of all, I'd like to make clear that when we talk, when we talk within a Sufi context about conversion, we have to be absolutely clear that they don't usually talk about converting people from their religion to another religion, but they talk about something psychological transformative that happens within their own selves. So we can talk about intra-conversion in the sense of people who try to influence other people, Muslim people, who try to influence Muslim people to awaken to a deeper sense of religiosity, of spirituality. And this is called Tauba in Arabic, conversion or conversio in other languages. Okay, this is one uh, comment that I'd like to make. It's kind of important to me because otherwise, why do we have a panel about Sufism and conversion together? Um, the second um, comment that I'd like to make is that um, somebody mentioned earlier the term perspectivity. Is that right? Is that the term that was used? I'm not familiar with this term, I haven't used it before. But I gather it means in what capacity does a scholar speak to an audience? And there are different capacities, there are different disciplines. Like for example, Ruven, no doubt, at least in my perspective, is a historian. He's interested in the, what happens in one period and in another period and he brings material to corroborate his ideas or he makes an analysis of the material that he has. But it seems to me that Judith is a different kind of historian. It's a historian which is, how shall I say, more a philologist, literary type of historian. Would you agree with that or not? You don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about it from my own perspective because I would say, although the material that Judith brings is Latino uh, medieval or late medieval Hebrew of a Messianic Catholic, which is, I have, n I have really no knowledge of it, I feel a kind of affinity in terms of the discipline that Judith uses with the discipline that I use in order to work with text, work with sources. It may be my projection, but that's how I see it. And then we have Daphna's paper. Now, Daphna is not here, so I won't, won't presume to describe her as a historian or social um, uh, culture uh, scholar or exactly how she would define herself. But it is important to make these uh, distinctions, at least in my understanding, because she's not really talking as a historian as such. She uses the, the, the hagiographical material about which I'd like to say a few things. But first, maybe, be, 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 before I talk about the hagiographical literature as historical sources, I'd like really to say something. This is more uh, elaborate uh, in, in, in my response, but something which is shorter relates to um, um, Owen's paper. Now, uh, in, uh, Owen's make a very clear thesis. He, he says, 
where did all the Sufis go? Where is, is that exact, the exact title? Is it still here? No, where have all the Sufis uh, gone? I meant to sing it. But I you meant to sing it, yes. The association is absolutely <laughs> clear. And, and, and I, 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 uh, I, I really, um, uh, wait, who am I to agree? But I agree with you. Because I don't know of any Sufi source which specifically talks about wanting to convert the pagans, to convert themselves, yes, in the sense that I mentioned before, to awaken, to become open spiritually or if awaken spiritually, that's a different story. But I don't know of any Sufi text of the 8th, 9th, even 10th century uh, about Sufis who want to go out and convert uh, pagans or, or infidels or whoever. So I totally uh, agree that it doesn't sound right to assume such uh, assumptions. Um, but what I'd like to say in this respect, and this will go back to my comment about her biography, is that there is a tendency within contemporary as well as medieval authors to project, to project back. Like uh, if we know, for example, that for certain there were Sufis involved in the Christianizations, uh, uh, excuse me, of Islamization, let's say, of Western Africa, there's no doubt about it. Would you agree? Yes, in Mali and, and in other places, or in Indonesia, there's no doubt that Sufis were active in the process of Islamization. This is clear, and uh, there are sources about this. But, it is absolutely not clear what happened in the 9th, 10th century. So it's a kind of projection from later periods into earlier periods about which we do not have any corroboration from a historical point of view. So this is, I think, a, a, an important, at least for my understanding, methodological perspective. But there is also a projection in terms of the hagiographical literature. Like hagiographical literature, is the, is the literature that was compiled usually after the uh, actual life of the, the protagonists. And it is done for, pe for a purpose. The hagiographical literature wants to praise, to, to elevate the figure of the persons about whom he, he, she is talking, right? And I have various examples for my own work. I'll give you one very short example that I have dealt with recently. There, there is a 9th century mystic that I have been involved with um, uh, since my PhD. And I come back to him again and again and I review myself and review his writing and find always how. Now, he, there is, uh, he wrote a short autobiography. That's very interesting. 9th century Arabic short autobiography, which is not intentional. It doesn't serve any purpose. He writes it like we write journals. Okay? He needs to write to relieve himself. It's very clear. And in his journal, he, he, he writes down dreams, revelations, mystical revelations. One anecdote that he describes in it autobiography is that he was expelled, no, sorry, that he was, uh, um, he was talking about love and, the, uh, and all kinds of mystical topics and the ulama of his place didn't like it and he was summoned to the governor of Balkh, this is again Transoxania, your area, so he was from Tirmes, from Central Asia, he was uh, summoned to, to Balkh and the governor of Balkh ordered him to stop talking about love. But he didn't stop, but that's the message that we get from the autobiography. When we come to the hagiography about him, to an 11th century hagiography about the same person, we read that he was expelled from his hometown. He was not allowed to go back there. Okay, so there are discrepancies. Here is just one small example to say that we cannot rely blindly about hagiographical um, um, information. They are important, 
but they have to be checked, they have to be verified, they have to be cross-referenced and, and stuff like that. So that's why I'm not absolutely happy with constructing a historical um, 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 process based on hagiography. Especially uh, that they, these hagiographies are rather late. Now, the theme, the theme of somebody, a Christian, uh, converting to Islam through some meeting with a Sufi, this is reported extensively even in earlier hagiographies than the ones that Daphna mentions. Like I, for example, I can think of a story from a hagiography of the 11th century telling about a 9th century Sufi. Uh, it's kind of a lengthy, it's a beautiful story. I would have loved to tell you, but I don't know if I have enough time. Uh, okay, two minutes or so. In any case, this is a story about somebody who wanders in the desert, a Muslim person, who wants to go to the Hajj or come, come, coming back from the Hajj and he loses his way in his desert and he doesn't know what to do and he sits desolate and dejected and then two Christian monks appear out of the blue and the, something very interesting happens between these three people. The gist of the story is that they do something very marvelous, the two Christian monks do something very marvelous for this fellow who is wandering in the desert, for this Muslim. And he cannot do the same thing as they do. They do, they do some kind of miracle with regards to food that they manage to bring out of, of, of nowhere and drink. And he cannot do it. But what he can do, what he can do is to let them, because there is not enough of the food and the water, he uh, gives them priority, these two monks, to drink and to eat, and he refrains from drinking and eating. And when they ask him why, he says, because our tradition teaches us the value of giving preference to the other. In Arabic it's called ithar. It's a very interesting virtue, giving precedence to the other. And this is what I'm, I'm doing. I can do this miracle that you do to bring out uh, food and water out of nowhere. And this so impresses them that eventually they convert to Islam. So is this a historical uh, information? It's a wonderful story. And probably quite a lot can be drawn out of it. But I would argue that the story of conversions via meeting with Sufis in hagiographies are more than historical information, they create a kind of genre, a literary genre, and they have to be analyzed and regarded as a literary genre, not necessarily, perhaps sometimes yes, but not necessarily definitively as historical um, um, uh, proof. Is that enough? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sferi. Uh, first of all, does any any of the speakers would like to respond to the respond? Yes. You would like. Oh, we have to. Come here. very much uh, for the comments. Um, and what, in regards to what you asked about conversion, uh, he, he's not using the, uh, well, he uses the derivatives of conversion in many respects, but not uh, in regards to conversion to another religion. And But we, he, do, he does have something that's very similar to what you mentioned, which is the restitutio, or tikkun in Hebrew, which has to do with an inner theological process but also it has to do with the larger theological process because, as, as I've mentioned, the whole thing is that um, this interreligiosity or the universalism or whatever 
is what this, this flexible um, perception of borders between religion and religions is uh, what enables him uh, to, uh, to, to draft this whole scheme of how the world should look religious-wise. And this is what allows him, for instance, to say that he has with Geyer in Hebrew. And he didn't convert. I mean, he did not convert to Judaism. But he says he has in it with his earlier Hebrew treatises, uh, uh, treatise, he said uh, he has this pseudonym for himself, and he says, Eliyahu, uh, never mind, Israel. And he did not convert, although some scholars uh, thought that he might have. So this is one thing. And um, well, what you said about history or thought, uh, the, the study of history, or whether I'm a historian or. Um, it's a two. Uh, yeah. It's 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 a, it's, a, it's a, the same the same line with uh, you no. Know, are are we not holding the same uh, rope from from the two sides of history and thought? All of us. <laughs> I'm hoping. Yes. Well, in a way. way. In a way, but I think some differences can be experienced. Maybe not. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, I'm glad you agreed with my main, main thrust of my talk. That makes me feel a lot better. Um, I, 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 friend, I'd also like to say, um, I'm, I'm sure you're, you do philological work, but I think I do too. So uh, I don't know. I, 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 do, I, I think it's more than philology, of course. It, philology is a, is a virtue, but it's not, um, it's not the only thing we, we, we don't. We're not satisfied with just doing philology, and we've had that talk too before. Um, but. Um, I, I, I think that uh, you know, all of us do, you know, everybody specializes in something and everybody tries to do as much as possible. And um, we, um, you know, I see myself basically as political, military, and social history of the Middle East, from Egypt to basically Mongolia from 1000 to 1500, which is, um, but I know I have to work with archaeologists, and I know I have to work with cultural historians, and I know I have to work with people studying religion, and I have to work with, um, and, and literature, of course, and, uh, I, I, and I enjoy it, I enjoy reading it, but I know what my limitations are. Um, but um, I think all of us, you know, that's a question, which all of us are here, mostly as historians, but not only, but we're here to, and this is also working with people from other cultural traditions and other historical periods, um, can only, uh, I've already jotted down a few things that I picked up this morning that are very thought-provoking, and I, uh, that's, I think that's that's the picture. So uh, I, we do different. We have different type of material we're working with too, of course, and you work with different type of material too. But I I, 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 I want very much to partake of what you have to offer of your understanding of Sufi doctrine and 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 and, 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 and practice, which I I will never research that. But I want to read about it. I want to read about it by people like you. So that helps me do the other things that I'm interested in. I'm interested in the Sufis as a social group and as a as tie, their ties with the with the elites and things like that. That's what interests me. England, and and we did. I could have also talked about what's going on in Palestine. I mean, that my current project, which I didn't mention in my little blurb, is um, is uh, working on Islamization of Palestine and surrounding area under the Mamluks. And the Sufis are there now. The Sufis aren't there singing and 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 hugging each other or hugging the Christians. They're there. You know, it's not hugging and and, and kissing. It's uh, pushing and shoving. Basically, and um, they're really pushing and shoving. They're doing the same thing in Egypt too, um, and it just kind of reminds of some certain trends elsewhere in the Middle East today. One sees that you know people coming in and being very smiling, but then pushing and shoving a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we will now open uh, the session for discussion. I suggest that we will collect uh, comments and questions uh, for the present uh, speakers and uh, the respondent. Uh, so, would any, anybody would like to make a question or comment? Now is the time. I just wanted to. I was I was fascinated by a, a connection that I saw in this, and, and, and sort of the opposite of the pushing and shoving that we know goes on all the time. But in in Daphna's story, it's a shame uh, she's not here to to talk to us about it. It was the story of the monk who entertains the dervish. And in, the, and in the document, it was with hospitality, um, in the sense of a kind of reciprocal giving, a kind of mutuality between these two. And it was this mutuality that enabled the approach. And then you referred to this last story that you told about the two monks who encountered the, the, the poor fellow uh, who was lost. And they also exchanged a kind of hospitality or a sense of reciprocity. And I wonder at the extent to which um, we might think about reciprocity, um, notions of the gift, of the kinds of things that I was talking about, 
um, as, as the, the basis for an approach. Whereas we tend to assume difference. We, we, because we're talking about conversion, we assume that, that something has to be converted into something else. And so we have to start from the premise of difference. That perhaps there are underlying things that are not a matter of difference, but are uh, the way in which people are joined, or at least can imaginatively, ima can imaginatively join themselves before they confront the problem of difference. And so that, because we, are, we imagine ourselves to be autonomous individuals with particular ideas that are quite distinct from one another, and because we don't live in a society that, that, uh, that prizes notions of reciprocity, perhaps we have forgotten the power of, of reciprocity and, uh, and hospitality. And in the context of the Guarani, for instance, when you don't have the rich texts, or at least the kinds of texts that you do, then you have to pay attention to other sorts of things. And I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if we were to find these kinds of uh, issues of hospitality uh, and reciprocity and gift are far more prominent in our texts than we have generally than we generally thought. So that it's not only pushing and shoving, but also uh, these sorts of things. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Rogan Anikai. In your talk, you mentioned uh, the variety of religions in Central Asia, mm -hmm. and uh, Buddhists, Nestorian Christians, and Zoroastrians. My kids, my kids, my kids, yes. And uh, I guess the, the question I had in my mind is how how do the agents of conversion compare if you take account of your Muslim traders mm -hmm. alongside? I mean, I'm mostly interested in, in the fact that up until the 13th century, it's not so clear cut that Islam will always be the one that's going to be the dominant religion. Mm -hmm. in that area, and, and, and I wonder whether agents of conversions have anything to do with that. Well, I, I don't think it was at all clear in, in 800 to 1,000, maybe by 1,200, that, 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 that Muslims were going to be, Islam was going to be ultimately successful in the predominant religion of, of Central Asia, and of course maybe even at the beginning of the Mongol period things were topsy-turvy, um, but um, the I'll just give two examples. Uh, one is that we have conversion stories of kings converting after, um, we have two stories, at the two different ends of Asia. Uh, I don't know if two stories is a topos, but it's the beginning of a topos. It's, uh, it's, uh, um, but we have the, you know, the Khazars and the, the, the story that's, you know, the, of, the, um, of the exchange of ideas and, the, and then accepting Judaism. And then, of course, we have the Uyghurs um, accepting uh, Manichaeism, uh, having heard every, various proponents from different from different schools or different religions talk, so they, they're convinced by, by one particular. And we also have, in terms of merchants, uh, merchants as conveyors of uh, cultural cultural uh, and religion, we have the Sotians, uh, who are all, basically, they're all over the place before the time of Islam, from China all the way across, uh, across Eurasia, into, into Europe, certainly as far as Crimea. And they were spreading uh, Iranian religions, um, Manichaeism and, and, and Zoroastrianism. And so, so um, there, there, I think there are there are certain things. People, people uh, Anatoly Khazanov has written about this, about religions, the religious change in Central Asia, and one sees certain constants that that. But eventually, Islam uh, uh, things changed with with monotheism, and they they changed dramatically. I mean, at the end of the day. Everybody from Central Asia all to the West, I mean, basically from Kyrgyzstan to the, to, and uh, the Uyghurs are all Muslims, and, to, there's, and then there's some Buddhists in Mongolia, a little bit elsewhere, where where people are, are where people are are Muslims, they speak Turkish, various forms of Turkish, and when people are Buddhists, they speak various forms of Mongolian. That's more or less the story, the breakdown in Central Asia today and in Asia today. Um, so uh, I don't know if this answers your question, but one, one can see certain similarities. Uh, My question uh, is, how do they compare? I mean, in terms of methods. Uh, well, I think uh, you have know, merchants as, as merchants as um, merchants as conveyors of ideas, merchants as conveyors of uh, culture. Um, I think that's an important theme, um, and uh, power from a powerful, rich culture. I think that they. In fact, Islam is conceived by the people of Central Asia as a very powerful, um, very rich, a very compelling place. It's kind of, you know, like America. People, you know, they obviously mixed feelings about America, but it's still Hollywood and, and, and the clothes and the cars and everything else, you know, it's very compelling in some way. And, it's, uh, and that's transferred by commercial means, too. 
Um, so I think the role of merchants, I, I, I agree, you know, there's no doubt about it that, that, that elsewhere Sufis at certain times, certain places play a key role, not the only role, but a key role uh, for various reasons. Um, one, of the, one explanation is they're out in the country. I mean, they're out, they're backwoodsmen, so to speak. They're, they're out in the country, they're in contact with people, perhaps more than with the urban ulama. Um, but I think the role of the merchants as conveyors, as, as, as agents of cultural change, and not just agents of, of, of conversion, and conversion is a form of cultural change too. So as agents of cultural change, I think the merchants are a, an interesting, we could talk about that as a world phenomenon. Um, uh, a phenomenon in world history, merchants is, um, and since, you know, the Jews as, as, as also as, a, as commercial people, or the Armenians as a commercial people, um, one can think of other people still that have a, a Dutch, you know, for their time in history, they were... Um, mm -hmm. They don't call that people Dutch. No, well, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I'm talking, again, it's cultural change. Beyond, beyond religious change. Please. I have a short question to Ruben. And, uh, to Sarah and Brian. Uh, so you, you, you point out that there, there is no evidence that there are Sufis in uh, the 10th century that are converting. When do, when do they come into the picture, if they come at all, in what ways and why? That would be the question to you. To Sarah, I would, I would want to press a little more on the issue of genre. So you, you, you identify a genre, but then what does a genre reflect? If, if there is such a literary construct as this genre and, and it's being written over and again, it reflects something. And I'm asking what, what do you think uh, it reflects? And to Brian, uh, I mean, you're, you're raising the, the issue of, of actually the joining rather than the exclusivity or the contest or the transformation of uh, a people and uh, what, they, what they share and so on. Uh, I'm not sure that, in this case at least, it's, it's reciprocity. Rather, I think that in the case we we're talking about the Christians and Muslim uh, uh, holy men, it's more of a, a common language. So it's not something that they're giving or necessarily taking, but it is this uh, ideas that they share. And of course, it would be interesting to try to see the genealogy of these ideas and see where it comes from and perhaps who is the origin and so on. But when we get to the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, we already see a, a shared language um, that perhaps goes to Peter Brown's uh, holy men uh, and so on, but I'm not, I'm not sure how far it goes. Okay, well, I'll start here. Do you want to ask questions? Okay, so let me get this out of the way. Um, first of all, I haven't looked into it deeply. Let's start with what's clear. In the 13th century, we have Sufism spreading and getting stronger institutionalized orders, uh, connections with the rulers in both the Mongol Sultanate in Anatolia and in, in the, the, Mon the Mongolian controlled territories from e east of the Euphrates all the way into Central Asia. And this is, so 300 years later, we're, we're in a completely different situation. And, it's a, it's a, and one could even look at it as a, perhaps as a Mediterranean phenomenon. The Franciscans are not similar, perhaps, the other experts here are at least different things on the other side of uh, on the other side of the Mediterranean, different but similar in some ways. Um, but um, I would say the following, that um, we, they don't wait for the Sufis to come out because the Central Asians, the Turks are coming into the Islamic world. By, by 1020 and 1030, there are tens of thousands of tribesmen coming in, in ver for various reasons, coming in more or less led by the Seljuks, more or less. Um, and they're coming into, they're coming into, uh, they're coming into uh, contact with all kinds of Muslims and all kinds of uh, religious pe figures, and the, the subjects themselves take on the trappings of a very normative, very establishment, very uh, Islamic, and they present themselves as defenders of orthodoxy, including fighting Shi'is, and that's part of the explanation there, Dranach uh, Westin, you know, that, so to speak, uh, going west to Baghdad and even hopefully making it to, 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 um, uh, to Egypt. And I think also they're coming, and, and also the time of development, it's not coincidental, this is when Ghazali also which is, does his great work in the synthesis between orthodoxy and, and Sufism, or the, whatever. Um, so I, 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 I think that uh, it's clear that uh, they are going to be affected, they are affected deeply, among other things, by Sufism uh, of various types. Um, and this will continue and get stronger as the, as the, um, as the, the generations go by until we reach a, you know, 
such a part of life. I mean, I hear even today people talking about you can't even distinguish where the Sufis start, uh, finish, and the ulama begin, or vice versa. They so overlap each other, and there's just so much, and, there, and there's a lot of truth to that too, which is the case in the 13th century. Yes, just to, to add to this, uh, before we uh, say something about the journal, I think that uh, d during the 13th century, perhaps even the 12th century, we have quite a lot of evidence about uh, Hanukkah or Zawiyas, that is the Sufi establishments, which are supported greatly by the rulers. So it's very clear that the, the situation of Sufism has changed, and it's changed before Ghazali, but we won't go into the whole thing. Uh, they become established and as established and carrying, I would say, this reciprocity, this culture of openness and benevolence, uh, it's easier to, uh, to take after them. Uh, so if I can add a historical note. As for Jeanne, Jeanne is very interesting because Jeanne is not antagonistic to historical sources. <laughs> but it uh, claims for a different kind of perspective. That is to say, if we find something in the 14th century, in the 16th century, in the 10th century, sort of variation of the same story, not exactly the same, not verbatim the same, but the, 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 it's, it's kind of literary um, 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 uh, features which can resemble and lead to the same point, i.e. the Islamization of some Christians, and there are very typical features, we can say this is a genre. It's not straightly forward saying that in the 10th century it was like that, or in the 14th, or in the 15th, or in the... Now we have to investigate, okay, so how did it start, and why did it start, and what was the, pers the purpose behind it, which is a whole different story. It is historical in a way, but it's a different kind of historicity. So uh, I, I think uh, literary journals have to be taken very, very um, um, uh, importantly, it's, it's uh, seriously, but it's not the same as really finding a source which says uh, here he was buried and you say, who is this person who was buried? He was a Christian and why was he buried in a Muslim uh, cemetery, i.e. he probably converted. This is a different kind of uh, information. So we have to be much more subtle with regard to the uh, deductions that we make out of literary journals. At the same time, we cannot just say that this is historical document as such. If it was written in the 14th century, it represents something pertaining to the 14th century. Not necessary. So it's an upright question. I'll, I'll do it without I'll, I'll the mic. Um, Nimrod, this is this is not my panel, so I feel a bit uh, like I've interjected in, into a place that I shouldn't be. I'll just say this. Um, I'm just thinking of it from the perspective of Marcel Mauss and the idea of, of the gift. And when I was just listening to Sarah's story, it's just an instantaneous, momentaneous reaction because I've not heard the story before. But the reason the, 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 reason the interlocutor uh, accepts is because the, the two monks were able to provide food. So it represents a kind of gift from a Mausian perspective. But he has nothing to give. The only way in which, and, and what, and what Maus says the gift does is that it, it, it imposes an obligation. Mm -hmm. And it imposes an obligation to reciprocate. And therefore, the only thing he can give is, is this preference, which from his perspective already comes from within his understanding of, of what it is to extend hospitality or something along those lines. So, uh, his tradition of teaching. You know the, you know the story better no, than no, I. No, I'm, I'm just saying it's not just the quality of his own. Right. He's taking it from his teachings. Right. Which is exactly yes. what, what Maus would say, that these are articulated, these yeah. notions are articulated in very different ways across culture, but there is something that extends underneath yeah. many different cultures, and reciprocity is a way by which people can approach one another even across what might otherwise be perceived as different. That's, that's and, the point. And if I may make another point here, there is a question of evaluation here. It's, the, it's evaluating miracle making vis-a-vis -vis reciprocity or favoring the other. 
other is higher in esteem, according to this uh, understanding, than miracle making. And there is a point there which is worth analyzing and uh, and checking as well. Uh, this is right. Yes. Yes. Um, now, very briefly, uh, Nadia Effenheim. Yes, uh, I'm glad to ask my questions and comments to you. Uh, well, Postel is not the first to tackle Kabbalah, the first Christian also. Postel is not the first to tackle Christian, uh, first Christian who tackles Jewish Kabbalah. Uh, actually, uh, so called Christian Kabbalah is. Um, invented or introduced into the Christian world by converts from Judaism, like Flavius Mithridates and Pablo de Heredia. But as opposed to them, as I see it, which is very strange, is that whereas they try to find the truth of Christianity or the roots of Christianity in Kabbalah, the Postel does exactly the opposite. And the question is where he got these ideas. I mean, this story of Johanna of Venice is clearly fictitious. So the question is, was he in contact with Jews who practiced Kabbalah, who knew about Kabbalah, who told him about these things? Uh, it is hard to believe that he reached all these ideas by himself, just by reading. So I wanted to know if we can add something to that. This is just a very brief question to you about, um, you, you were talking about the um, Political arrangement that within which Postel is, uh, is working, and the fact that he's using, he's um, looking at uh, François Premier. Ah, okay. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. I'm afraid I will forget everything on behalf. So I will. Is that okay? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The Joanna story. What do you mean by fictitious? But by not being a real person. <laughs> oh, it's a real person. Joanna, I think I think we have, um, first of all there are documents uh, the person existed and uh, well we don't have anything by her she was a nun not that she didn't leave anything written but uh, he has uh, in his writings he has many quotations uh, of her mouth by the way in Italian you could do it that now you got it um, I didn't see any reason to uh, doubt uh, the fact that uh, it's a real person. Um, you, what you were, you, uh, what, what you said is, is very true. If you try to compare um, Postel and, a, a, for instance, the trials of Viterbo, on the one hand, with Pico and others uh, who are trying, the, the first were trying to um, to find evidence for Christianity, as you say. And here he has something new. He has his own new religion. Uh, where did he get all the information? I think, uh, first of all, we know who he learned from. He learned from a, a Wittmannstetter for a few months, and he learned uh, um, uh, from the writings themselves, and probably uh, Eliado Vita uh, when he was with the Bamberg and Venice and others. But uh, he was very inventive. And when I went uh, over, for instance, his uh, Zohar commentary, I could find evidence uh, for the fact that not everything he writes Kabbalistically is Kabbalistically right, so to speak. Um, uh, which means it doesn't always follow the regular symbolism that we're used to. So yes, he makes a lot of things up, but, but uh, in general, he does follow, um, he does follow uh, principles of Kabbalah. And um, and he makes a lot of a lot a lot of uh, he fills he fills the space with uh, with Jerakamism uh, and with uh, French nationalism and with okay. okay there's a lot more to discuss okay <laughs> I'm very sorry a, no it's fine it's just a quick question you were talking about the political alignments and the fact that François Premier is, is very important within his worldview um, does he at all relate to the last emperor legend, all this discourse of the last emperor that's very prevalent in, in, in the Holy Roman Empire. I mean, within the empire, this is very big. And this kind of, you know, what he's doing is on, so to speak, on the sidelines of this, but is he in dialogue with this tradition at all? Does it appear in this, in, um, in, in this, in, in this tractate or no? Uh, he is really into the part of the Kohen, of the Pope. <laughs> which he identifies himself and Joanna uh, with. And uh, the king part was more problematic because he tried to convince several kings 
to, yeah, and it was not very successful. By the way, he continued trying to persuade all kinds of French kings uh, to, to, up to, uh, to his death, and obviously, uh, and he sticks them. to French kings. He doesn't, yeah, doesn't, he, he did. Not. He did. Even when that failed, unlike uh, unlike yeah, like of Viterbo, who turned to uh, Carl V, right. he so, didn't. No. So who is the concealed king? He, he writes about the concealed king. That's a very good question. So I think maybe it is the last emperor. When I read it, I thought yeah. that, like you, that the concealed king is, the last is Frederick uh, or something like that, the last emperor. I don't know, but in Tama Te'amim, it's... I have a feeling that specifically in Tama Te'amim, he has a different notion, really, of a king and priest and one person. This is a whole new topic. I'm not sure it's the right moment to get into that. And that person would be um, himself. <laughs> um, yeah, but I... What? Presumption. No, not your theory. I'm just quoting. I'm, don't blame me. I would like to thank all our to thank all our speakers and respondents and to wish you all a pleasant and delightful afternoon.